Chapter 24, Lost and Found and Lost. We were up early before the sun. The council meeting was fast and heated while we discussed the best way to do this. To their credit, no one even mentioned the possibility of staying out of it, not even old Bullet. Let's get these bastards. Let we get the elder, we have the key. She was heated. We need to organize the families to start a pack up. We'll have to go deep into hiding after this. They'll come for us for sure once we initiate the, a fight. Clarence spoke from the experience. Out on the prairies, the Cree had put up a fight. They held up for a pretty long time too, before the armed forces were brought in with drones to pick them off. We loaded up every available weapon, mostly bows and arrows pulled taut with young wood and reinforced with repurposed wire. There were a few guns, ours included, some crossbows and an arsenal of knives. There were 19 of us without slopper, who we made stay back to supervise our pack-up. Each one of our little crew was armed and ready to fight. We had all suffered beyond dignity with the loss of two of our group, and the thought of getting one of them back made us almost unreasonable with motivation. The mapping was the most important part, since location and surprise were our two biggest assets on this mission. Most of our morning was spent studying the route and picking out the best vantage point to wait. They aren't loading up a big convoy. They don't think there's much of a threat. It would be even be smaller if they didn't know about the council. Father Carroll had explained before he ran back to his car by the main road, and then rushed back to his office in town before he was missed. But still, their ego is big enough, they feel pretty comfortable. Just don't, don't you feel any comfort, not yet. Soon enough, it was 11 o'clock and the transport convoy was scheduled for noon, so we made our way into the trees. French, you need to remember these arseholes will be locked and loaded. My dad pulled me aside as I filed past the council, whose older, older or disabled members had lined up to see us off. I know, Dad. And you remember, they don't think of us as humans, just commodities. He cupped his palm at the back of my neck and held me there in his anxious grip. I know, Dad. You take care, French. Don't break cover. Just disable the drivers and wait for them to abandon, abandon the cargo, just like we planned. I know. I'm serious. Don't go playing hero and rush out in sight, because they'll shoot you dead where you stand. I'm good, Dad. We know. No one is going to break cover. We stay in the trees and wait for them to leave Minerva. It took General putting a hand on my on his shoulders for my dad to release me and let me run into the woods. I turned around at the edge and gave him a little wave. I wish I hadn't. The terror on his face sent needles of adrenaline into my muscles. We split up close to the road and scrambled in, put into position. Me and Derek lit, lit into the boughs and leafy nooks to crouch and lay. Uh, the rest of the group lined both sides of the road along a hundred foot stretch where it narrowed and from encroaching bush into a single lane. The plan was to wait for the convoy and shoot at the tires, and then we disabled the drivers or allowed them to run into the woods, at which point we'd tie them up so they couldn't join the ranks uh, that would be sure to follow. It was an hour away from town, so we wouldn't have much time before the cavalry arrived, and then we'd spring Minerva and join the main camp who'd already be on the move to another safe haven, a straight short shot north from here. Uh, before I scrambled up to my spot, Meg put his pouch around my neck. For safekeeping, he told me, just in case. I can't lose this. I cannot go back to the schools, no matter what. I tucked it into my t-shirt and patted it against my chest, nodding to Meg, then ascended. Eleven bodies flattened against the ground at the edge of the woods. They were safely out of sight up the slight hill from the road. And that's where Rose was. I'd made sure of it when she insisted on coming. Don't get macho with me. No reason at all for me to not fight. She was cold around me, but I was too excited about Minerva to unleash any real venom as I protested her involvement in front of the others. I had a feeling it wouldn't be all smiles and playful arm punches later on when she got me alone and let loose. Mig and the twins joined two of the main campers near the road and just before the serrated edge of asphalt began. They were crouched behind an outcropping of rocks left over from a small avalanche off the hill years before. Chiboy had run up the road to, to the start of the vulnerable curve to scout out the convoy's arrival. Derek, with almost a braid almost as long as mine, hanging over his neck and dangling like a vine, was in a pine straight across the road from where I was perched in sticky balsam. I caught him watching the girls in the tree line, including Rose, and whenever he looked to my side, I shot him the finger. To my annoyance, all he did was mime laughter, all theatrical and quiet. And now we waited. The trees were here were thicker than down the road, which made this the perf spot perfect. They threw their shadows over the road like the plaid of Minerva's favorite skirt. Minerva. I couldn't believe she was on her way to us right now, and that we were going to get her back. We had to get her back. Once she's on the main highway, there'll be more traffic. Then in the capital, well, then she's gone into a maze. Father Carroll had spoke candidly before rushing off. It's now or never, I'm afraid. 
Noon approached in a slow crouch, pulling itself along the road, warming the air to, to honest-to-God spring. The ground was thawed now, and the bellies and knees of those in the woods were damp. The air smelled of mud, and with the abundance of precious water, everything, with the potential of being green, flexed and groaned, and desperately began to grow. You could almost hear the leaves opening, like reaching fingers, almost feel the trees pulling their posture straight. A long, low whistle unfurled along the cracked asphalt and landed in my lap, barely audible, and then only to those listening, Chee boy signal. I stopped breathing, and the scream of quiet filled my head to bursting. Then, from a short distance away, came the rumble of a motor, then another, and then the gleam of glass and mirror reflecting the midday sun winked into the horizon. Here they come. Everything happened in a blink of an eye for the muscles that brought movement. In the mechanism that drove them, where panic had woken and fear stalked prey, everything took a thousand years. There were two vehicles, a dusty red car with blue doors in front and, 20 feet behind, the white van of our collective nightmare. Father Carroll was right. They were cocky. Only two vehicles for a weapon that could bring them all down? I guess they were still considered her just another Indian after all. Mistaking their arrogance for stupidity was our mistake. They were going about 80 kilometers an hour before they slowed down to take the curve. This was our chance. The archers drew and released and the, and the road was littered with arrows that flew in a trained arc. Some hit the road like hard rain. One punctured the roof of the red car and another hit the front tire. Bang! It blew. And the car skidded to the side to side before the driver got control. By then a second wave of arrows had been loosed. The side window had shattered and the second point broke the rubber of the useless tire. The driver used an elbow to push the smashed glass pane out onto the road. Gun! Trine screamed from his spot, just before the driver shot at him. Hands yanked him down in time, the bullet skidding off the rock and into the gravel with a sharp hiss. The driver took a second shot into the trees, and I heard a man's yell, and General slumped to the ground, holding his right shoulder. My mouth was bone dry. I leveled my rifle on the branch just in front of my face and put the car in my sight. It was almost stopped now, and the driver still shooting, the tire wobbling off the rim like a hula hoop. And then I saw the van speed up and try to overtake the car to get away in front and away. And before I could aim, shots rang out from the other side on the road, and the van screeched to a halt the long whine of the horn, like a solid alarm. The driver was hit. I looked up in time to see Derek lower his gun. He looked over at me, and I recognized that face as one I'd just worn a few weeks ago. He wouldn't be shooting any more to, anymore today. His one lucky shot had put him into retirement. The horn kept going long and sharp, covering the sounds of the passenger door opening and the slap of hard shoes. A blonde woman with a messenger bag was flying out by her side, dashing into the woods, shooting blindly behind her without turning back to cover her escape. Chiwe would be waiting for her just past the first cluster of birch. Now the archers released another wave and the driver in the red car didn't have time to back up. He was punctured with a half a dozen arrows, some along his arm, the last one cutting through the meat of his neck from one side to the other. He fell into the, into, onto his side, dead in a pool of his own blood in the curve of the empty passenger seat. Another man, a recruiter with a whistle, shorts and a baseball hat, opened the back door and stepped out with his hands raised in the air. I saw him mouth, his mouth open and close. He was speaking, but I, we couldn't hear him over the thick shriek of the van's horn. The twins crawled out from behind their rock with the length of rope, Mig watching their six with his revolver behind them. They scrambled across the road, still crouching a bit in case there was anyone left shooting. And when they got within spitting distance of the car, they threw the rope and pretty much lassoed the recruiter. When his legs snapped together under the rope, he fell over, his sun sunglasses smashing on the pavement, hat rolling off his head, and the twins were wound the rope fast and tight and then gave Mig the thumbs up. Zeguan snatched the cap off the ground and placed it sideways on his brother's head. It was done. Chiboy ran back from the woods. The female tied at the hands and feet were thrown over his shoulder like a bedroll. Derek was already jumping the last foot to the ground, and those who had attacked from the trees were walking cautiously towards the road. Before I scrambled down, unused rifle on my back, I sought out Rose, spying her and Wob, embracing in the dirt expanse between the woods and the road. We had done it. The twins, two hats for two heads now, whooped and hollered while they dragged the recruiter off, the off to the rocky outcropping. A couple of main campers were already in the trunk of the red car pulling out the spare tire. Vehicles were a valuable coup, and even one stuck a full of arrows like a metal porcupine. We all met at the van, gathering around the back doors like little kids. Chiboy grabbed the handle and yanked. It wouldn't give. 
locked. We read his lips since the horn was still going. It must have, we, we must have gotten used to it. Mick pointed to his fingers to his chest and then towards the front of the van. He gave the international hand gesture for turning, uh, turning a key. He went to grab it from the ignition. Tree and Ziguan swapped hats back and forth. For the first time, I saw Wob and Chiboy for what they were as they stood there, his long arm thrown over her shoulders. A couple. I laughed my relief, knowing Minerva was here. She was actually here. I cut my hands over my scene, over the scene between the two back doors and shouted, Min, it's us. We've come to get you. It's all Nishin now. We're just grabbing the keys. Suddenly, the long drone of the horn stopped, and it was all shocking, like the absence of ground at the start of a fall. Then, like punctuation, a gunshot poked a hole in the day, and all the air ran out. I leaned around the side of the van in time to see Migwans, both arms shoved through the window struggling. The driver, not dead after all, fought back. Chiboy ran to the other side and yanked open the door. The van rocked with fight, then there was a second shot, then the van was still. Mig rushed back with the keys in his hands, fear imprinted between his eyes. Are you okay? I was confused, searching Mig's torso for signs of blood. Why was he shaking? Did he shoot you? I, sh I reached out and pulled up his buttoned shirt to the side, looking for a hole. It wasn't me. He forced key after key into the lock until one of them slid to the hilt and clicked. He didn't shoot me. Mig met my eyes only for a second, but I saw panic there. It stitched into his iris and brought electricity to the surface. He yanked the door open and she fell into his arms. Obviously, she had been pushed up against the back doors, waiting for her rescue. He caught her and sank to the ground. I dropped my, to my knees beside Migwans, grabbing at Minerva like a kid, like I never had when we were on the run. I grabbed her hand, placing it in my, under mine and over the hole in her chest. Blood, hot and sticky, gushed out between our fingers. Her thin shirt was already soaked through. You're going to be okay, I lied. And she smiled, patting my hand, comforting me, even now in my distress stemmed from her own peril. The blood blossomed under my knees like peonies over craggy asphalt. Minerva wore a blue, navy blue jumpsuit. Her hair had been cut short, and I barely recognized her. The lines on her face were deep, the deepest around her eyes. She had no sweaters, no long johns under skirts, no kerchief over her head. But when she opened her mouth to speak, I knew it was her for sure. She leaned in close to Meg and spoke in words in the language. They fell softly on his face. They must have been real nice words because he smiled then and closed his eyes so that the tears that welled up were pushed out onto his skin. And Rose was weeping loudly. She dropped hard to the ground and gathered Minerva's head in her lap. No, no, Nokomis, don't go. You can't go. She was shaking her hair and her her eyes wild on her face. Kiwen, Kiwen, promise, Minerva whispered. And Mig nodded. Mig took her other hand and she began to sing. Low, sweet words, depleting breath that wasn't being replaced. I knew she was going. And Meg picked up the verse and sang, and it, tra it was a traveling song. We were frantic but silent. We needed her. We all needed her. She couldn't go, but she was singing her song she'd already begun. And the whole world stopped for that one moment, for an old lady in a jumpsuit and a weeping man covered in blood and anguish to, to sing a new sound into the wind, to make sure she left with the dream so that she'd have all the magic she needed. When she was gone, Meg placed her hand back on her chest and rubbed her arm, smiling. I gently placed her hand on top of the other and stood, and Chibwe walked to the gathering crowd to give them the news. But Rose, she couldn't let go. She picked up one of Min's hands now and held it to her cheek like a broken bird. Kiwen, she whispered, rocking her foster grandmother, stroking her forehead with a handful of loose curls at the end of her braid. I stayed beside her so no one would interrupt, doing the only thing I could do now, right now, allowing her to grieve. Rose looked up into my fa face. Kiwen, she says, go home. I looked down at Rose, her beautiful face swollen with tears, holding the old woman's head in her lap, still rocking her, her sticky, bloody hands trying to straighten her shirt to smooth down her cropped hair. Heavy tears blurred my vision. I was looking at Rose from the bottom of a well I couldn't remember falling into. What? Kiwen, Frenchie, you must always go home.